This girl is 11 years old. She was interviewed here in her hometown of Chicago. When asked who it is she cares for most in the world, she said her sister. Her favorite thing about her sister is having conversations with her. Ladies, your food is ready. It's a hot dog with... When asked why people work, she said, to earn money. Thank you. She considers herself good at knowing whom to trust. At 11 years of age, this young girl is already shaping her place in society. She recognizes right from wrong and shares feelings of pain with others. When asked why friends are important, she replied, because they are there for me. What is it that makes people naturally sociable? This is the purview of Adam Smith. Here in Scotland, a few hundred years ago, in a seaside town called Kirkati, on a quiet street, in a modest house, lived Adam Smith. So who was Adam Smith? Describing him is as much explaining who he wasn't as who he was. Smith is most often associated with economics, a field which didn't exist in his time and is little understood today, with most economists believed to be either fortune tellers or stockbrokers. Further, Smith is associated with capitalism of the greedy, villainous variety. His ideas would be named capitalism only long after his death. In truth, Smith was a moral philosopher, a teacher, and author of two highly influential books which most people haven't read, and you probably won't either. They were The Theory of Moral Sentiments and An Inquiry into the Nature and Causes of the Wealth of Nations, or simply, The Wealth of Nations. Both books were first and foremost about harmony, one socially and one commercially. Having died in 1790, Adam Smith is now about as unknown to the larger world as ever, and those who do know of him often distort his work. However, amongst economists, law theorists, and other scholars, he has enjoyed a tremendous growth in influence and appreciation. Smith asserted that empathy, along with self-interest, defined morality, and that commerce is a natural part of humanity. Man is an animal that makes bargains. No other animal does this. No dog exchanges bones with another. Smith recognized that the interests of others were the reason for the great availability of comforts and necessities of daily life. The meat we eat comes from a butcher. The bread from a baker. Smith's glass of beer from a brewer. Each provides these goods not out of a sense of benevolence, but for personal gain. Smith believed that as people bargained and socialized, their separate interests might align as if led by an invisible hand to mutual benefit. Every individual neither intends to promote the public interest nor knows how much he is promoting it. He intends only his own gain and he is, in this, as in many other cases, led by an invisible hand to promote an end which was no part of his intention. The invisible hand is one of Smith's most well-known turns of phrase, and yet he wrote it only once in each book. In both The Wealth of Nations and The Theory of Moral Sentiments, the invisible hand is not so much a guide as an amoral, spontaneous pattern which changes as people engage with one another. The invisible hand is Smith's way of saying outcomes do not necessarily align with people's intentions. And while the outcomes can sometimes be negative, overall, they have a positive effect on society. When Adam Smith published The Theory of Moral Sentiments, it was an immediate success and fame quickly followed. 
Smith became so highly regarded that students would travel from across Europe to attend his lectures at the University of Glasgow. But even after he found success, Smith didn't pursue celebrity. Instead, he continued to lead a rather quiet existence, living with his mother for much of his adult life. Smith warned against the allure of vanity, urging the pursuit of virtue rather than power and fame. His hypothetical poor man's son is a cautionary tale for the ambitious. The poor man's son, whom heaven in its anger has visited with ambition, when he begins to look around him, admires the condition of the rich, and in order to arrive at it, he devotes himself forever to the pursuit of wealth and greatness. In the last dregs of life, his body wasted with toil and diseases, his mind galled and ruffled, that he begins at last to find that wealth and greatness are mere trinkets of frivolous utility. The poor man's son's pursuit of power and wealth hadn't brought lasting happiness, and ultimately, his wealth meant nothing. So then, what is wealth? 